This is the Game Changers Experience. Deep dive conversations with leading business disruptors, Olympic athletes, celebrities, entrepreneurs, and influencers from around the world. This show will teach you insights about the winning principles in mindset, productivity, marketing, branding, entrepreneurship, business strategy, and more. Hosted by Productivity Authority, business strategist, former elite athlete, author, and public speaker, Adam Strong. Welcome to Helping Organizations Thrive. Uh, today, this morning, I have uh, Adam Strong uh, on the show. Good morning to you, Adam. Good morning, Julian. How are you today? I'm very well. Good to see you. And just going to let the audience know, you, you are a business strategist, podcaster, a speaker, uh, as a keynote speaker, and author of the play, the game, how to win in today's changing environment. And you help elevate leaders to build and scale their, their business fast. And today we're going to be exploring, as we just mentioned just before we came on the show, a lot, uh, but we'll see where we go about mental resilience, entrepreneurship, mindset, and mental hacks that can help you overcome uh, challenges and you've got some interesting backstories on all that I know. Um, before we get into that, I just want to ask uh, what do you love about uh, what you do? What I love, what do I do? Um, I, I, I think for me, is what, what I really love to help people, Julian, like genuinely and authentically love to help people. So, you know, I, I've got a passion for identifying, you know, what people are challenges people are going through and being in entrepreneurship from such a young age um at the age of 11 um it just gives me a real de deep sense of happiness and sense of purpose you know what i mean so i think in in sh in short answer to your question is that's the real reason is it's people actually make in and people that i enjoy working with um gives me that sense of fulfillment and going back to that when you were 11, I know the story, and uh, it's interesting because I have a very similar story to that as well. When you oh, share yeah. that moment okay. where I um, I was six years old, I was with my brother doing it together. I was six and he was 10, and um, which is interesting, actually. So tell us that sort of flashpoint of when you that sort of sparked about sort of entrepreneurship. And mm -hmm. if you can reflect back on that, what, what, what was the spark that made you think, actually, I'm going to do this and felt this putting yourself out there and starting to generate some revenue, even at the age of 11. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, I was actually reflecting this back on this this week. Um, I'd actually created a carousel. I don't know if you saw it on LinkedIn and kind of broke the the journey down, but I give, give the audience um, just some context. So I wasn't born with a silver spoon in my mouth, basically, as for most people, I guess, you know, entrepreneurship is a choice rather than kind of like a skill set um on my background um as a young kid i um i lost my hair through alopecia uh, and this was made due to a number of different factors such as going through the foster care system my mum wasn't particularly well she um, she suffered and still suffers from um long-term depression um and and i just generally had a lot of um worries um at, at a very young age as most kids don't really experience this type of worry but i experienced a lot of um uh, a lot of worries uh, when i was young and um yeah and at the age of 10 i'd locked my hair through alopecia so i haven't had hair on my head for well over 30 years um me, we we kind of share that same thing, uh, but yeah, <laughs> mine, took, mine took a little bit longer to go, but it is gone. <laughs> yeah. It's gone, is exactly. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so I lost my hair at the age of ten, um, and this was due to uncertainty and stress and worry and things like that. And I I was bullied a lot. I'd suffered from asthma um, from a very young age. Um, still remember the times of when I was on the bus, for example, with my mum. And just out of nowhere, I'd end up having an asthma attack. So, you know, pretty, pretty darn serious, you know, mm. uh, and this was at the age of 10. Um, so, and I was, I was the kind of kid, I was, a, I was a very introverted type of character. You know, I kept myself to myself, you know, I, I did, fair, I did try to enjoy school up until the point of like, when I lost my hair, I, I wear, I wore a sports cap, Julian, because I would, I felt so ashamed about the way I looked. But also, 
I used to have a lot of kids that were uh, in a way that they were fearful because I was different. Do you know what I mean? So they, so they'd pick on me and they'd bully me and, and things like that. Um, you know, it's not particularly nice. Uh, and then by the eight, by the time of the age of 11, I was just a bit sick and tired of life. Honestly, we lived in council house, uh, or council flat, third floor council flat in West London. Um, lived off the stadium to have a large amount of money. So mum was a single mum at the time and I got my brother as well, but we didn't have a lot of money at all. Uh, lived off the stuff some some weeks it was tough like we couldn't even afford bread and milk it was that tough uh and so you know life was wearing me down even after a year of like losing my hair and stuff like that you know like, you, you 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 can only take so much do you know what i mean you can only really take so much before you kind of like oh do you know what i mean it's like kind of one of those and you know and, when you are at the age of 11, you're going through your changes as well, puberty, things like, things like that. So, uh, so interestingly enough, I, um, I, I don't know. I, I was walking through, um, I had this kind of like, call it an epiphany, if that's what you want to call it. But basically I was just out daydreaming, walking along, um, along, well, I was in a nature reserve effectively. And they just out of nowhere started appearing, in the streams were, were these golf balls. And I'm like, huh, that's interesting. Yeah. And I didn't really think much of it really, but then there was a local golf club, um, which was kind of like right next to, um, uh, the nature reserve, which was separated between a long stream that went through the, the, the boundary of the, the golf club. And so I thought to myself, gave me an idea. And then next day I decided to go back with the bucket. Um, just a normal plastic bucket and I, I essentially literally just jumped into these streams and started foraging through bushes to find these lock golf balls um, and then um, and I got approached um, by two elderly gentlemen um, in their early 70s running over and uh, shouting out watch out you know, watch out, like, because obviously the golf course and the, they didn't want to be seen as hitting a 11 year old boy in the head with mm. a golf ball would be a bit embarrassing. Um, anyway, they came over to me and they're like, So, so what are you doing here? Like, you know, you could have been seriously hurt. I'm like, Well, I find a lot of golf balls. I'm like, oh, that's interesting. Um, and then they looked into my bucket and um, they're like, Yo, you've got some decent balls here. Um, and this was around hole 15, so about three, four holes um, left. Um, and most of these guys had a very high handicap, so they were amateurs more than more than professionals. Um, but effectively, <clears throat> they uh, then we got into the whole kind of like, they he asked me, they're like, would you be interested in selling your golf balls? I'm like, yeah, sure. You know, and, and so I remember quickly, I started to learn more about the golf industry uh, the importance of brand, for example, like I, I pick up Slazenger's Dunlops. If you're a golf specialist, these are like big brands and they would, you know, even for one golf ball these days, it'll cost you like 12, 15 pounds for a golf ball, which is absolutely crazy. Um, but <laughs> so we, this is how I kind of like got into sales and negotiation because they'd be like, well, I'll offer you two, three quid here for this ball. But I knew that mm. the ball would be worth in excess of seven, eight quid minimum and um, 15 pound retail. So then we would um, have this kind of back and forth sales and negotiation. And um, obviously uh, we would shake our hands. I'd, I'd walk, I'd walked home for the first time with a f- pocket full of pound coins um, rallying. And then I get interrogated by my mum thinking I'd done something wrong. And then I told her the story <laughs> and she's like, wow, that absolutely blew me away. And so, I spent the majority of the weekends finding, uh, even after school, just finding those golf balls mm-hmm. and uh, setting them on and, um, you know, and giving a contribution to change our family fortunes effectively. So that's kind of like where where the resilience has started to kind of uh, develop, really. I mean, um, it's an interesting and it's an inspiring story, Adam. And it's, it's um, just... Uh, I remember myself doing something similar. Literally, we, my brother and I—I I was six, he was ten—and mm-hmm. we were walking by a golf club and go and started to pick up these golf balls and literally sell them back to the the golfers. And we remember going out freezing cold during the winter. 
well he's on and everything else and i can't remember even how much we sold them for this was many many years ago but started <laughs> and we do we did all sorts of little jobs like that and this sort of entrepreneurial sort of spirit was was born i guess mm. just just going back to what do you think business just to understand from you about that that was the start of your journey and was it because of the, the the environment you were in or was it something you think you're born that way or circumstance or just talk me through your, your reflection on that of what made you think actually i'm going to go for this and take this opportunity mm. yeah it's a good question i think um 11 was a very special age for me it was like and through your midlife crisis, but I went through at the age of 11 rather than 40 or 50. Um, because effectively I'd got into, um, you know, I mentioned to you, I'd got into distance running as well at, at that, at the age of 11 as well. And again, <laughs> it's interesting because that proved as a, a bit of a catalyst to kind of wanting to change my life in a way. Um, so it wasn't just, struggles of financial struggles uh as a family but also i was just a little bit sick and tired of life yeah and it was just kind of like my stake in the ground thinking you know i've got to do things differently here so i suppose in a way it was a bit of a catalyst Mm -hmm. um or an instigator to get things done a, a little bit so you know i'd got into distance running actually about three months after I started my first of all, entrepreneurial journey, I, I got into entrepreneurial through um, by accident. If I'm honest with you, it was all through accident. It wasn't through. It was all through circumstance. Um, it, and I suppose you know you have these epiphanies or these um, or a, a message from the universe or whatever it is you know without getting too spiritual, you know. And it was kind of like messages from the universe saying you know you can change your fortune you can do something a little bit different just by doing this mm. um yeah so i got into distance running about three months later um and again my background is i didn't really have a father figure around to encourage me or in you know so i didn't have those mentors those coaches and those kind of like people that you could look up to those role models mm. so i literally just got out of my comfort zone, turned up at the the athletic track and just literally said, hey, I'm interested in joining your running club. And they're like, okay, so what experience do you have? Um, not a lot. I had, I, I mean, I'm an asthma sufferer. Um, like what? She is like, yeah. Um, so what do you want to do? I'm like, well, I want to do distance running. And so she walked us down, you know, without trying to say too much. And you have these judgmental, um, <clears throat> You have these judgmental perceptions of like where I mean the the running tr- the running club that I joined is like in the it's like the Premier League, you know what I mean? They were in the Premier League in the UK, and so they were one of the best clubs in in, in England. And um, yeah, my first interaction with uh, with my coach and where I met my um, what my met my uh, the, the current world Olympic world champion Sam Murfara, he was my training partner. Um, back then because he had originally come from Somalia similar we you know we got bullied but got bullied and things like that so we, we had this kind of similar background in a way so we used that uh, I suppose we used that kind of experiences and played it against mm. each other in terms of healthy competition but while everyone at my age which was playing video games and by the way I love playing video games and stuff like that uh, I was out on a Tuesday Thursday evening in the cold minus five minus seven temperatures uh in my shorts and t-shirt putting in the work you know and again i remember the running track itself um was all floodlit but we would always train on the grass which is Mm. at the back of the uh, running track but it had no light literally zero light so it was really dark in the winter and um and so it would be very boggy. Uh, you know, the grass hadn't been cut for months on end because it had been the winter time or whatever it might be. Uh, and again, this is where I feel like I started to build up that mental resilience because if I thought to myself, well, if I can, and, and, and again, I used running as a way to increase my confidence as a catalyst, but mm. also um, as a way to um, thought it, it 
you know, running and starting up my first business, you know, it helped me not just build confidence within myself, but it also helped me kind of like take perspective of think, well, if life can throw uh, that at me, then I can kind of like counteract and give it even better. Do you know what I mean? So those are, to mm-hmm. me, 11 years ago was very special because it was those two life experiences that has um, really kind of helped me to become the person I am today. And you, you shared that you, you saw it as your midlife crisis point, which is is interesting at the age of 11, um, which, you know, sort of probably sums up where you were at and or what you've been going through and, and the troubles of you know, being bullied and everything else and mm-hmm. difficulties uh, in the upbringing and everything else. Um, what advice would you give somebody who perhaps is facing that, whether you call it midlife, it can happen at any age, but where they're mm-hmm. just feeling a bit like lost a little bit, bewildered with life, a bit confused. But what advice would you give based on your experience to help provide that clarity for the next step and how to go about that? I think you have to really ask yourself a number of questions, really. Um, and really have a good chat to yourself, which sounds really ridiculous. I mean, we all talk to ourselves, really, and I'm sure we all do in secretly. But, <laughs> but you know, you're it, rather than kind of letting the inner critic uh, get the best out of you, is to really kind of ask questions to yourself and think to yourself, what's my purpose? What's the reason why I'm here? Or why am I here on this world, in, on this earth? You know, what is, why am I here? What is my service? What is it I want to do with my life? You know, uh, and what am I, how am I bettering myself every day? You know, so, you know, I, I'm a big believer in fine margins or small, fine margins. We call it in athletics, fine margins, because if we're making one cent incremental improvements every day, then we're going to become a bigger and better person. Do you know what I mean? So we're if we're not making progress, then what are we doing? So mm-hmm. you either you either moving forwards or you're moving backwards. You can't really stay the same. Can't stay the same. You can't plateau. You're either moving forwards and back. But the only way that you can only move forwards and back is by taking action, by executing, by mm-hmm. being accountable for your actions. Um, you know, and again, taking a step back and, and saying, what well, what have I done to move towards my purpose? What is it that I'm looking towards, looking towards to achieving my legacy? What is my legacy mm. um, of why I'm here? It's it's looking at a much bigger picture because we all suffer from a loss of direction, uh, a loss of lo- loss of purpose, or whatever it might be. But it's it's really asking really strong questions of yourself, and this could be applied to organisations. You know, there is a lot of companies out there that have exactly the same thing. They get locked. They don't know why they exist. And they just think that some, sometimes they just kind of plod along. And, you know, that's where insecurity comes in. And uh, and that's where uh, people, a lot of organizations and individuals, that's where they begin to plateau. And, you know, they begin to uh, go down that spiraling path, which doesn't lead to a, to a positive outcome. Yeah, and I, and I like what you mentioned there, that it's making yourself a better version of you, not comparing to anything else, but you know, mm-hmm. comparing yourself, what you were yesterday, today, all that sort of stuff is, is more helpful and, and getting that real clarity on, you know, what you're here for, what's the purpose, what's your mission. And I, I think that for me, and I, I do a lot of work with clients on that really helps once you get that, then you start to work out what are what my goals, what, what am I going to do based on that direction? Mm-hmm. Where are we going to go with that? And I think that's, that's getting that ground in. Um, I want to just go back to a little bit on that aspect of where you found uh, the running really helped build confidence. And, mm-hmm. uh, and I just want to sort of probe it up. But what, what was it about the running? And, and how did that start to, I guess, build that mental sort of res- resilience in you uh, mm-hmm. as a person? Well, as I mentioned to you, um, I was an asthma sufferer. <laughs> so getting into distance running probably wasn't the greatest idea in the world. Um, you know, we're all full of great ideas. That probably wasn't the smartest idea. Um, but <laughs> effectively, I remember when I first got started, I, um, I, 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 I didn't do particularly great. I literally found it even difficult to run 100 meters, let alone do distance running. And it really took um, a lot of tenacity 
uh, continue to to keep going. In a nutshell, I don't know. I don't know what it was that kind of kept me going, but I just kept on saying to myself, "Why not? Like, why can't you do this?" You know, I just kept on asking specific questions around that. You know, give me a reason why you can't do it, type of thing. I just kept on battling my inner critic more than anything else. And so, within six months of training hard and making a lot of self-sacrifices. Um, after six months, uh, my asthma had disappeared, completely disappeared. And that was due and to I, you running no medication as such? And... No medication, no medication. It was literally, what they're, what they're saying is, because I'm using my, I'm increasing my lung capacity and I'm increasing oxygen and the way it flows, it's, it, it's just helped get rid of asthma completely um, and so once i i'd got rid of that and overcome my my asthma and stuff like that um, i can then start to become stronger uh build up my endurance and um and again you know just kind of it helped me to give me a perspective of you know what i can do this i, I can do this whatever life throws at me, i can do this you know if an asthma lover can do it then i can do it so, you know, that was kind of like where it kind of started from. Um, and that's where it, that's where it really kind of started from. And when you sort of reflect on your, your life and, you know, you know, what you've done, obviously since then, obviously you've built your own businesses in terms of um, what you do and how you help other people. Um, what, what, what are the sort of daily habits and routines or practices that you've, done you do now that helps continue to build that mental resilience uh, I'm, again, I'm presuming you're doing it but I'm, I'm, again that's a presumptuous here uh, but what are the things <laughs> you're doing that will help you sort of maintain it because it, it's uh, something that continues to grow and I think resilience mm. is a like a muscle isn't it we've got to continue to stretch yeah. it build it and keep it active it is um I think uh, a few things really uh, you know it's really interesting you brought this up so I decided that this year I wanted to get myself completely out of my comfort zone. So one of the things that if you really want to build mental resilience is that you have to prepare yourself to get yourself out of comfort zone. You have to do that because otherwise it's not going to work. Right. And it's like anything, if you're going to the gym for the first, second, third time, expect to have sore muscles after the workout. You know, and, you know, it's like anything. I remember when um, when I was in a high sports performance uh, coaching and I used to train uh, people that were preparing for events and I used to get them to do exercises, which they absolutely hated. And they hated it because they weren't very good at it. But after a, a few weeks, even a month, they could start to see those improvements. And because they started to see those improvements, they didn't hate it anymore because they were much better than they were when they first started. Mm. Um, so this year I've decided to, I don't, if, I don't know if it was out of ego, but I, I really wanted to test my self-discipline. For me, one of the um, key skills, that I suppose, and habits that I had learned earlier on is the importance of self-discipline. So, this year, I decided to, in fact, only recently, I booked to do an adventure race um, mm -hmm. in summer. And, and what adventure racing is, it's a bit like triathlon, yet the activities are completely different. So adventure racing, Julian, is trail running, it's mountain biking, and it's kayaking mixed with orienteering. So it is a bit of a, a, a mixture of stuff like that. Um, and I thought to myself, you know what? I fancy a piece of that. Um, but I decided to enter in at the master's level, which means it's a six-hour race, uh, non-stop, of course, uh, and it's going to happen in a couple of months. Now, I believe that I can do this. Like My mindset is that I'm going to do this. I don't have a choice now because I've entered it. Uh, whether my body tells me is a completely different thing, of course. Um, so... <laughs> I'm doing it because I need to prove to myself, but number one, I've still got it. 
I know, I know it sounds really ego driven, but I need to prove myself to say that if I can do this, I can conquer anything. Doesn't mm-hmm. matter if I wanted to go to Everest or whatever it is, but I literally just proving to myself that and and you know, through self discipline, through um accompli- accompli- achieving this uh challenge and stuff like that, I can use my experience and apply it to my business and to the clients I work with. So um yeah, so I hope, I hope it kind of gives you some context. Yeah, it, it sounds a uh... A, a quite a challenge. I mean, I've done I've done triathlon and Ironmans before, um, and I've always thought about um, adventure racing because I, I used to do loads of kayaking when I was younger. And nice. I, I'm not the greatest of swimmers, you see, so I think kayaking to me is better than swimming. So, um, agree. Um, but no, but it, it's there's something about that the mix of sports, uh, and it, and there's a lot to think about and a lot to sort of contain. What 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 do you th- what will be your mental sort of preparation for that? Because there is a physical aspect clearly, and I'm sure you're doing various physical training. Um, what, how are you preparing yourself mentally to, cause it's not just about the physical and that it's the mental piece will get you to the finish line, won't it? Yeah, no, you're absolutely um, spot on there. Um, I think along with my preparation with regard to positive self-talk is very important. It's if you, if you're going out and it's like, say for example, you're due to do a training run. And um, it's really easy to shy away and think to yourself, oh, you know, it's raining today. Oh, skip training. Do you know what I mean? It's easy to, to be a cop out. Mm. Um, it's easier when you've got an accountability buddy. Of course it is. It's easier because we push ourselves that little bit further. Um, but it, for me, it's positive self-talk is really important. Yes, um, you can use affirmations as well if that works for you. A lot of sports psychologists um, use that and, you know, look at them. You look at yourself in the mirror and you're like, let's do this kind of like Rocky Balboa type of style. Um, (laughs) But also um, the other thing, the other reason why I'm actually going to be do probably going to be raising money for charity as well. So um, and that'll be towards um, uh, helping clean up our oceans. So there's a there's a reason why I'm doing what I'm doing. It's not just for the for the ego and testing my self discipline. Mm. There's a bigger picture to it all. Um, and again, that kind of gives me the extra reason why it's worth it. Does that make sense? Mm. Um, so I, I think I, I feel for like mentally, um, through the experiences that life experiences and what what I've been mm. through, I'm pretty mentally prepared. Um, up here because mm. I know I can do it. I, I've done it before. It hasn't. I haven't done it for a while, but I know I can do it. Mm. Um, but for the average Joe blog um, or Joe public, I would say you know certain certain habits such as you know affirmations, uh, even listening. I used to listen to and still do actually on YouTube. If you type in the uh, the most uh, best motivational video ever, and you'll get these like celebrities or athletes and stuff like that, and they're like, "Yeah, you, know, you can do this type of thing," you know. And 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 do you know what? It sounds really corny, but you know, I love that. Do you know what I mean? I, I love that. Mm. It's kind of like a cheerleader. You know, it, it, even watch like maybe Jackie Chang or Bruce Lee type of thing. It's like, yeah, I can do this. I can dominate. You know, so it's you know it's trying to add you know positivity but mm. or add that kind of fuel to say you know what i can do this i know i can do this um it's just you've got to put the work in yeah interesting about the, the watching things and hearing affirmation like that is really helpful because i think you can then you when you see something you believe you can do it as well it, it sort of opens up the possibility and uh, and i like that you mentioned that whole having a sense of meaning or purpose to why you're doing something and rooting that i i recently coached uh, a lady uh, sally orange as a name uh, and she did seven marathons in seven days in some continents and i really helped her with some mental hacks and resilience uh with that and one of the core things we, we did talk about was about uh getting rooted into the purpose and her bigger purpose is is all about mental um health and and talking about that and, and communicating that and that's why she does these crazy events and so she uses that so when so when you're struggling you use that as a, as a source of energy inspiration and it's bigger than the the race itself and the moment uh, and it, it's far more impactful um i'm sure 
at, at times you've had uh, I guess sort of failure along the way with all you've done whether that's in racing or in, in business uh, I'd just be understanding what, what's your perspective on failure and, and how do you use it as a help you to go forward I guess and, and understand explore that a little bit as an interesting um viewpoint of of failure i um when i first got started i kind of mentioned when i first got into running for example i was a complete failure i can assure you even when i started competing at um you know uh, at higher standards whether it be county or national level the amount of times that i had i wouldn't quite say that i came last place but i was at the back of the pack, should we say? And again, it, what that does is it um, is 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 it doesn't make you feel good because it's like, well, I'm going to be lost or whatever it might be, and 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 things like that. But again, it's those kind of experiences. Um, I don't see things as failure, even whether it be in business. Um, I have a slightly different viewpoint from when I was younger to to now. I see failure as a as a as an opportunity to learn, and what I mean by that is I failed probably more times than I've succeeded. I'll be the first to put up my hand up and say that you know uh, whether it be in business, whether it be in athletics, it doesn't really matter. I would say that if I hadn't failed, there's no way I would be the person I am to for me today. Hmm. But also. You you learn more from losing than you do from winning, uh, and that's that can be applied in any sport, American football, soccer, whatever it is. It doesn't really matter, but you can learn so much from failure alone. And uh, I use it as a as again, I use it as experience, but I also use it as a what can I do to improve upon myself what 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 areas do i need to make improvements to so if in business for example you know if i failed at a particular task or whatever it might be i might ask questions such as what can i do better next time you know what why was a failure how what am i comparing that to Mm. you know and what could i do next if i was faced with a similar similar uh, situation so it's about asking specific types of questions and 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 learn from those experiences so that we either are more prepared or more mm. resilient uh next time or that we can maybe advise others that may be going through the same experiences that you've been through mm. yeah, I, I really like that and i think it's it's almost not dismissing failure but reframing it a little bit i, I tend to use the word see it as feedback really it's using it as an opportunity to sort of what can you learn and i think that's the important thing and i think you tapped into something important is to see failure as a learning opportunity and as you say we tend to learn more when we lose uh, in scenarios uh, obviously we want to win occasionally as well but um of course it's where you where you really do um sort of learn and i think it's important and it it just sets the the, the mindset to more positive to looking for opportunities looking for open ideas and ways of moving forward rather than being stuck in the past and uh, beating ourselves up and and it, it can be tough at times uh, and the element of you know that emotional rah at first which is important to just get out your system uh, mm-hmm. but then again look for those opportunities and the wisdom in that um just uh, again we're just about to finish now so adam so just in terms of people want to connect with you want to get in touch with you what's the best way of doing that I think that probably the best way to contact me is uh, is on LinkedIn. Um, I'm very regular on LinkedIn, so you're welcome to follow me on LinkedIn and click the mail bell notification. If I post up content, then you'll get notification. And uh, yeah, um, you're welcome to check out my website, adamstrong.net. Feel free to reach out on there. And uh, yeah. Well, well, thank you for coming on, uh, Adam. I really appreciate it. And loved hearing your stories and inspiring us uh, with how you've overcome things and continue to do that. I uh, really appreciate your time today. Thank you. Appreciate the opportunity. Thanks a lot.